and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I'm your host, Adam Porters, and joining me today, he's still fuming that Astro Boy shoes weren't Adidas, sweet Sean Kovacs from the internet. How does he get his hair like that? <laughs> and his nickname on the dance floor was Astro Glad, Bruce Leslie. <laughs> I'm a prickly pear, but I feel like a robot Pinocchio. Oh, there's a the many a, many a plot that you could pull out from this, and we'll talk about all that today. Welcome back, everybody. This week we are checking out Astro Boy. That is available on Tubi right now, or as Bruce likes to call it, Tubby. Oh yeah, because you like to bring down the <laughs> the, the, the streamers' uh, confidence. I guess I don't know. Uh, it's spelled Tubby. Well, and and you are Bruce Leslie, so we just kind of have to go along with it, nod our heads, and just go like, sure, that's that's correct. Mm -hmm, Why not? Mm -hmm, that's right. Mm -hmm. If you, if you don't, he'll just uh, got, he'll dig his heels in even further, and you're just off to the races. <laughs> you don't call them the Teletubbies. <laughs> no, that's a that's a fair point. Uh, but before we get into that, we do want to say a big giant thank you to the people that support us over at patreon.com slash HMP. Those fine, fine people get the pre-show, post-show, danger zone, doesn't matter what level that you support at. And of course you get to vote on what we watch every single month. And since we're coming up on episode 400 here, that's a four zero zero, uh, we're going to kind of go back to some of our early roots here and give you guys a smattering of things to choose from that were amongst our first reviews on HMP. We'll see if our, uh, See if our thoughts have changed over the past. Our recording style certainly has. There's a whole lot less uh, fake um, fake voices. Uh, not for me. That was my real voice back then. Oh, this one, I've been working for years. <laughs> I, I, I seem to remember me being a higher pitch. I, I might be wrong. But. I, part of that will definitely come from technology because it's going to mess with your head a little bit as to what kind of stuff sounds like and really... Some shows that I've listened to for, you know, almost like 10 years have upgraded their sound as as goes on. And like, you know, sometime around like time two or three where the sound changes decently, you're just like, well, this is as good as it gets. And then like five, six years later, you listen back to some really old episode and you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Have you ever listened to a podcast for a long time and they get like an equipment up? grade like the sound is better but you don't like it as much because you had like three years of getting used to what they sounded like before i had that happen once sometimes yes but like ultimately at least for me it's got to be down to you know is it something that's worth listening to and and you can you can go through some really crummy audio if if you if you like the things that are going on but if you don't like it it doesn't matter how clear that bad boy is it could sound you know that perfect NPR you know soundproof room and everything if it's not engaging you're not going to listen to it <laughs> yeah but uh, we thank all of you who listen to this show and the people that support us every single week over at patreon.com slash HMP. Uh, you guys will be voting at the end of all of this fine, fine stuff. So people can blame you if the choice is bad. That's all on you guys. And so it takes the it takes the weight off of us for a little bit. Uh, but we did want to uh, get into it this week and find out what was going on with the Astro Boy. That's as best as I got for, uh, you know, looking up the <laughs> the 2B trailer in the uh, Hyundai parking lot and everything. So here's the trailer for Astro Boy. In this secret lab, the world's top scientist is building his most incredible creation. He has the most advanced systems ever created. Perfect robot. Your boy? Yes, sir. <laughs> Hello? <gasps> Ow! I'm Cora. Call me Astro. Hey, I think I found something. It's just junk. It's been dead for at least a century. The kid has hidden talents. You have no idea. Greetings from the Cora off the chart. My army could use a robot like that. Mobilize all units. I want that thing now. What's with you guys? You got it, sir. We're coming home. You okay? Oh. Send in the peacekeeper. Now. Is this thing on? 
this October. Ha, ah, cool. <laughs> Declare war on them. You want a piece of me? <laughs> Who's driving? <laughs> when the world needs saving, he's built for the challenge. I have to take care of this. Astro, no! Astro! Astro Boy. Huh? I got machine guns in my butt. <laughs> well, Alrighty, that was the trailer for Astro Boy. You know what time it is. It's time for Bruce's comic book connection. Bruce, I'm aware that this is a comic book of some sort, but to be honest with you, I know absolutely nothing. Shine some light. Well, Astro Boy sprang to life as a manga back in 1952, written by Osamu Tezuka. And when translated literally, its Japanese title was Mighty Adam. And that's the name Astro Boy goes by in Japan even today, at least as far as I know, which admittedly isn't very far. But the manga is the age-old story of a scientist who builds a robot to replace his dead son in the distant future year of 2003. <laughs> now, Dr. Tenma soon realized that the little android could not fill the void of his lost son, especially given that Astro could not grow older. So Dr. Tenma rejected Astro and sold him to a cruel circus owner, a guy named Ham Egg. Now, in 1963, Astro Boy became the subject of an animated series, and that particular series is widely regarded as the first anime, or at least the inspiration for the art and story style that has become associated with anime, in particular with shonen anime. Now, Astro Boy was initially very popular, being the first Japanese animated television series to make it to the United States television sets with the highest ratings of any show at the time however its popularity eventually declined to the point where only 104 of the original 193 episodes were released in the united states and the primary reason being that it was still in black and white when most television sets were switching to color however you can't keep a good robot child down and many revivals have come around since the original run including a computer animated film we plan to review today and speaking of computer animation, Adam, do you have a list? Indeed, because if that comic book connection wasn't enough for you, let me sell everybody on this animated adventure, because this movie has everything. We got the future. We got robots, rich people, poor people. You got the plot to Frankenstein. You got the plot to Pinocchio. You got the plot to Superman. You got the plot to Ex Machina, Elysium, Ghost Dad. The list goes on and on. We got boot flying, underpants wearing, face punching, feelings faking, father, son, son, father, man versus machine, and a much deeper movie than you might expect for a movie that made for 8 to 12 year olds. This movie has everything in it. And somehow I don't I, I can't believe it doesn't feel like you like this movie at all, Bruce. I found it uh, slow. I'll just go ahead and say it. I found it slow and it seemed to miss the appeal of Astro Boy, in my opinion. Hmm. Like it, it's not that it's necessarily not good, but like when we watched the Speed Racer movie, a lot of people could say that Speed Racer movie's not good, but it kind of had the the gestalt of Speed Racer in it because there's a lot of racing. You know, and a lot of weird racing. But mm -hmm. Astro Boy, the, the whole appeal of Astro Boy is you've got this little thing that's like just constantly punching and beating up big things. It's like the same kind of appeal that I think went with Mighty Mouse. And this, you have to wait so long before he punches anything. It just, it, it really lost me, man. This one uh, definitely did not pass the phone test with me. I've, it, it's what, less than an hour and a half long? Yeah, it's a little it it is a little lighter than an hour and a half. It does But it felt like it took all afternoon when I was watching it. It it it, it does slow burn for something that does have as many action scenes and stuff as as, as it, this movie actually does have. <laughs> and it pulled the classic maneuver of setting up a sequel we'll never get. <laughs> the you know, I I thought it was just fine. Um I was surprised quite honestly. I thought that it was going to be a, a trash heap this movie. Um it's a little soulless, you know, there is that part to it. Also, when you set up in the first act that a child has been murdered, um <laughs> you, maybe you need to bring that up again. It's not it's not enough that he, you know, he's just 
built a robot. No, he's boy. he's gone now, and I have moved on to the robot boy in about point oh two seconds. Yes, so you know that's that's problematic. Uh, but I was kind of surprised by the level of storytelling in this movie. I mean, it's not it's not tremendous. But it's not what I, I like. I, I really thought we were getting like Nomeo and Juliet level animation. Yeah, and, and that's not, the thing. It's not that. When you look at kind of the the original poster with the the light background and everything, and just some of the advertisement and like if you'd seen only a couple of you know shots and stuff from trailers and everything, there's times where this thing looks ridiculously cheap and just kind of, kind of badly done. And then mm. there are other parts where it's like, oh, they saved all of their time and stuff for this area and stuff. So like it's it's a little bit I, I was I was actually astounded. There there were some times where it was like, oh wow, this animation actually looks really, really good. Sometimes it's flat and a little bit boring, but other times when they really want it to be, it can look quite good. And I, I don't I don't know anything about the original concept to the show. So so Bruce is 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 Astro Boy a dead boy made to be a robot? Yes, the the son died in a car accident. I see. And uh, originally, Doctor Tidma did sell Astro Boy because he decided he could never love him the way he wanted to, which is reflected in this movie. Mm. Uh, sometime in the sixties, I think it might have been a little later than that, but they kind of retconned that to the point that Astro Boy was kidnapped by the uh, circus instead of being sold. And I think the kidnapping angle would have worked better in this movie. I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there that it totally, totally lost me when the father's just like, nope, take him, destroy him. I don't want him anymore. Like, yeah. I, I think this would have worked a lot better yeah, it, with the kidnapping angle or at least have him fall. It to, really to makes Earth it to, by accident. It really makes it to a point where you're like, I, I don't care at all about Nick Cage's character anymore. Like, yeah, that guy, that guy can get can get wasted by the uh, by 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 the big robot. But you know, just some time if you got a minute, just watch like a one or two minute clip of some classic Astro Boy cartoons on YouTube, and you'll see it's very much like Mighty Mouse. You just see the little kid fighting either giant robots or giant monsters, and it's just like action. A little like, fanfare in the action. You know, they don't bah, bah, bah. really build a whole lot of emotion with it. The the his fists tell the story. Right. And this really like drags on. I feel like they're kind of trying to make like that movie robots that had Robin Williams Oof. doing one of the voices a movie. I did not like, I, I really feel like they're trying to take an, a, a simple, straightforward action hero and trying to tell a Disney fied story a little bit or a Pixar fied story, which they just can't do. And also, I mean, isn't it always kind of a, an issue where, uh, studios that are making movies based for the U S market, don't do a good job of adapting uh, anime and manga. It tends Generally, to be the yeah, case. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it's the situation. I mean, we're like the Western filmmakers think that they are smarter than the people who sold a hundred million copies of this story. There's there, there's also the, the there's some of the things I'm guessing where they had to Americanize certain things about Astro boy. It's, it's just, it's just a read I'm getting like, uh, I watched this week. I watched Train to Busan, um, that that zombie movie. Yes, and it is terrific. It, it it's great. But there's certain cultural touchstones in that movie where it, there would be absolutely no translation into American, and uh, and and I like that those little bits because it's like, man, that that's some kooky, that's some kooky Korean stuff right there. Like like oh, that's the stuff. Like that kind of thing. I think that the Astro Boy could use some of that, quite honestly, where it feels foreign and it feels other, uh, you know, other landly. And and and, and, and it saying, would, here's it would Astro Boy to... playing Pogs. <laughs> and I'm not saying it needs to be hand drawn, but you know they they do like the computer generated animation now that looks hand drawn. Astro Boy. It's it'd be like going and seeing did did they ever make like a Charlie Brown with 3D animation like a Peanuts movie? Didn't oh they yeah, they uh -huh. did. They did a couple years ago. And like sometimes the classic stuff, it just feels too weird, you know, when you see that 3D animation to it. Like, could you imagine? I, I don't know if they ever done like a, a 3D Disney movie with with like Scrooge McDuck and uh, Mickey Mouse and stuff. Wouldn't that just feel off? Yeah, I mean they got all the. 
I, just from an animation standpoint, kind of all the um, Kingdom Hearts games and stuff like that, that sort of falls in that kind of yeah, category. Yeah, that's a video game, though. But yeah, yeah. I, I and the, and the new saying. DuckTales does have 3D animation in it with with Scrooge. Is it like Pixar-esque? I didn't watch the No, movie. it's not like that. It's, yeah, it's more you like You know what I'm rendered. talking about? Like this style of animation doesn't have any whiffs of cell animation. Type. I do. And and I think, I, and I, I see where you're going with this. Like, you know, it, it at least while watching the Peanuts movie that came out a couple of years ago, like that's a very well written movie. So yeah. it, like it takes you a couple of minutes to get into it where you're like, I don't know if I like, and then because the, sti- the style does up. throw you off a little bit at yes. first, and then you realize it's like, oh, this is just kind of a, it's really an elevated version of you know the old school you know right. peanuts animation, and and it feels you know like it doesn't feel like it's from the sixties where we watch you know the Christmas thing yeah. and the Halloween thing, but the I, I'm guessing that if you are an Astro Boy fan. You absolutely hate this movie is my guess just because it doesn't feel like, I mean, it feels more like the ant bully than anything else to me. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. It it feels like all those things trying to be Pixar that just didn't have what it takes. Right. Right. Cause the and, writing and, isn't there and the, and the cleverness I'm trying to think of Maggi. I'm looking at it. A Maggi animation studios. This movie sunk them. Like, oh, did they, it? Yeah. They spent so much money, uh, relatively speaking, they're a, a company based in Hong Kong, mm. but they basically put all their eggs in this, uh, Astro boy basket. And it was, it was the, the end of them. They spent 65 million for a $42 million box office. I think they Freddie just, Highmore just took that money and ran baby. <laughs> <laughs> he had to cut a little bit off for Samuel L. Jackson to say his one line. <laughs> the I, cast is kind of crazy on this movie. Yeah, I mean, so we we've got Nick Cage as as the Doctor Frankenstein essentially. Um, yeah, which it, like here's the thing, he plays it pretty well. It's pretty close to the vest Cage. He's not going to bananas in any of this, and uh, for a thing where he's animated, I, I, it's kind of nice to see him toned down a little bit. I'll yeah. just, if you don't mind, I'll just kind of read off the recognizable members of the cast that we haven't mentioned yet. I guess um, Kristen Bell is in it. Eugene got, Levy, Bill Nighy, uh, Don hold on, Sutherland, hold on, Nathan hold, Lane. Oh, hold, hold, hold on, because first of all, right out of the gate, you've got a problem here because yeah. if you've got Kristen Bell in your animated movie and you don't have her singing a song, that's on you. Like, <laughs> like she's got a great voice. You should totally have her singing a song. It's ridiculous. I'd say the same goes for Nathan Lane. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. Nathan Lane, he's a song and dance man. Here's the thing, uh, uh, you know, and... Nick Cage should sing a song a, a too. A kind of a, a kind of a low key, uh, you know, Nathan Lane kind of performance as well. It's not as you know over the top as as it could be, and it makes it more realistic, which is kind of nice. I, I just I like how he's the one who's like, I used to be up top. I was doing all of these things. Now I'm down here, and he's kind of become adopted father to all these you know ne'er do well kids and stuff that are down in the down in the poor side of town. Charlize <laughs> Theron is the narrator in the opening. Yeah, it feels mm. like she owed somebody a, a favor. It sure does. She was like, Alan, okay, I'll do this. It'll take like five minutes, and then I'm out. Alan Tudyk, he's done a lot of these voice acting jobs, so that one, it seems like he's in his lane. Mm-hmm. David Allen Greer and Ryan Stiles. I mean, some names, some recognizable names there. I mean, well, and of course, Donald Sutherland is like our main kind of bad guy and everything. Yeah, so. the president. He's great. I mean... He looks like 87 other different Disney characters, but he's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but- so one of the things that I, I want to talk about with you guys, because I just find it fascinating, is Freddie Highmore himself, right? So he came onto my radar. I don't know about you guys, but he came onto my radar during the, the Chocolate Factory remake. The Oh, you know, yeah. yeah, that's that kid. Okay. Yeah. And so... He is one of those guys, he's one of those actors who, like, you can't see, at least for me, this is my personal experience with him, I can't see him in a certain role until he's in the role. So, like, you know, he's in Bates Motel. He plays Norman Bates on the TV show Bates Motel. Mm -hmm. He's great in it. He is great. And then, and then he's in uh, that movie where he plays the, um, the young kid with Asperger's who's a doctor. Oh, that's the good doctor. That's a TV show. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, again and again, he keeps showing up for these roles where you're like, 
oh, come on, you're putting that kid in there? And he and he does it again. Mm-hmm. And so I think that he's going to be one of those actors who's like just sneaky around in our lives for like the next 30, 40 years because he started so young. And it's not that he's not a, like a bad actor because he's not. I think he's a very good actor. It's just it's just that he's not a great actor, you know. Like he has no fifth speed on that gear shift, which is maybe, which is fine. Maybe he's so good you can't even tell how good he is. That's how good he is. <laughs> it's just amazing to me that he just keeps working. You know, he was a child actor, and and I guess he was good in in the the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory remake. I guess right. Yeah, he was I'm, fine. I'm, I, it wasn't he bad. Was a, he was okay for in what that. for I, what that movie is. You know. Right. You know, and, and he, he's not the biggest defender in that movie for by any means. No. He, and he's cute enough. But like the like just that that kid has gone on and he's worked for the last 15 years. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty amazing that 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 has happened with this kid. Uh, he's just coming up on uh, 30 years old this year and we'll have uh, got 38 projects listed on IMDb. So. That that's works not, out to not, almost one a year. That's, that's pretty good. That's pre- pretty darn good for him. So uh. yeah, I, and, and he's good. I mean, th- that's the other thing is that you know I, I might sound like I'm downplaying him, but he is a good actor. He's not somebody who I'm like. I, 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 let me start over. When I see that he's cast in something, I'm like, really that kid? But then I'm like, oh right, right. He's actually good. Totally forgot about that. Yeah, there, there's a handful of those people out there that you're just like, oh, I don't know about that. And then you get in two seconds, you're like, that's right. That This is why I'd let that, that person is a, uh, like Lawrence Fishburne, because sometimes you yeah. think that, and then you're like, oh, that's right. Lawrence Fishburne is fantastic in everything he's in. So no, that's, that's not true. That's not true. Hey, well, that's not true. You, uh, when you get good Lawrence Fishburne, it's awesome. But bad Lawrence Fishburne is the worst. Hey, listen, he he made the right decision in not being in that new Matrix movie. So, yeah, like, yeah. how sometimes I don't think he made that decision. I think he's kind of <laughs> bitter about that decision. Actually. I, I bullet dodged you. You you dodged that sucker like Neo, boy, because you got out of the way of that. Uh, I bet you horrible take a career for about stinker. 800K. Uh, you know. <laughs> Nah, he's he's got he's got more uh more uh, DC movies to cameo in for five seconds and like get <laughs> that true. nice paycheck and is like, hey, he's, can I keep this fancy wardrobe he's, he's and everything? And they say, Mar- yeah, he's still waiting for Marvel to announce their Black Goliath TV show on Disney Plus. Guys, he's already yeah, he's already in. He's already in Marvel. Listen, he can go wherever he wants. I'm fine with that. <laughs> he's he's going to try to get him a role in one of those image movies like Spawn. Can't you guys just call me Goliath? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Bruce, did you ever watch? Were you a uh, like uh, any any Astro Boy memories or anything like that? Because that just, just it never just, really registered for me. I always saw it as like, like an iconic things, thing. Um, definitely not iconic to me. It's like one of those things that every now and then, uh, like. I don't know if it would be TBS or USA, but like early in the morning, they would take whatever cartoons they could get cheap and just kind of show them. Yeah. Right. And every now and then I would catch it. It was sort of like a battle of the planets or speed racer back then. Uh, where You didn't watch it on purpose, but it would just like pop up on a Sunday afternoon or really early in the morning. And you know, planets. yeah. So you'd watch it and sometimes you wouldn't even get a full episode. Like they would take out clips you know, and it would put it in like with a bunch of non Warner Brothers, non Disney shorts that they would package. I'm sure you've ran across some of those off brand cartoon packages and they would just have oh, yeah. like, I don't know, seven minutes of him fighting an underwater giant squid or something <laughs> and then go into to like the the thing that looks like Tom and Jerry crossed with Laurel and Hardy that I don't know exactly what it's called. I think it, <laughs> it, it might actually be called Tom and Jerry, but they're humans. Uh, it, there's this weird off off brand oh, cartoons I used to watch. Do you, so maybe it's different in, it was different in the South, but you know, growing up in New England, you basically Astro Boy came on at the same time that Transor Z came on. And there's no way I'm missing Transor Z. I'm well, watching Transor Z. You're talking Z. about the 1980 version of Astro Boy then. I, I don't know. Because I'm talking about the black and white Astro Boy. Oh yeah, it definitely wasn't black and white. Yeah. And, and like I had a black and white TV until I was in about the fourth grade. So I didn't even realize I'm watching like the cheap black and white cartoon because they're all black and white. To they're me all at the time. black and white to old Bruce. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sitting there on the 13 inch uh, black and white TV and I'm watching Astro Boy because, you know, it kind of looks like like Mighty Mouse. And I was a big Mighty Mouse fan back in the day. So it's it, now now is so with that original story and everything, 
is it more focused on Astro Boy or is the dad as much of kind of a character as this? Because I think that may be where this movie had maybe a problem was it was just trying well, to strike, here's the dad side, here's kind of the son side of you going, oh, I'm this new being and stuff. Like, that's a whole movie well, itself. I'm, I've never read the manga at all, you know, so that's probably where more of the story development would take place. Like I said, I didn't watch, like, episodes in order I just caught what were probably parts of episodes. I don't remember ever seeing the dad. Just punch, I don't remember punch, ever punch. seeing anything other than Astro Boy and like evil, evil robots or evil monsters. Like Astro Boy was the only person who even looked human in my memory. We got to call Astro Boy. There's a big robot beating up the bank or something. And then he comes in, fights yeah. it. And Bob's your uncle. There you go. You're done. That's well, I mean, kids in the fifties yeah. are entertained. <laughs> I'm, 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 my guess is is that the the way that Astro Boy is paced out is very similar to you name checked it earlier, Speed Racer, where you know it's 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 not a very complicated plot. It's you know, hey, you gotta you gotta do this, and then and and and, and then the day is saved. Thanks, Astro Boy. Like it's it's basically going to be that just over and over again is my guess in the cartoon. And and in my mind, you know, I've been comparing it to Mighty Mouse a lot, but honestly, like, you know, that classic, the most famous of the Fleischer Superman cartoons where he's mm-hmm. fighting the giant robots in uh, Metropolis. Yeah. That feels like an Astro Boy cartoon a little bit. Or oh, wow. First, I should say. Yeah. Only, I guess, in black and white. And it's a smaller underwear clad version of Superman. And not, and not rotoscoped. Yeah, definitely not rotoscoped. It's hand drawn for sure. Well, I think we can all agree here that uh, seeing Astro Boy in not just a, a, a pair of shorts and shoes the entire time is a, is a welcome. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, probably, I, I just, he just always like, look like a little kid for of your name Hey, else. let's let's just watch this small child with his shirt off and a pair of underpants and sneakers fly around and beat people up. I don't. I, it's he's a little not weird. a real boy. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> That's, he's like a kid Namor, the hair and everything. He got this. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Oh, instead of wings, he's got blasters on his feet. Well, he's fun. not as he, chippy. He's not he nearly as He would shoot like as... lasers out of his butt. You know, there's the part where he's like, oh, there's a machine gun in my butt. I distinctly remember scenes where it looked like he was a bee. Like, you know, uh, sometimes in cartoons, the bees would like shoot barbs out of their butt, out of their mm-hmm. stinger at like Daffy Duck or whatever. Well, I remember him shooting lasers out of his butt. And that's why I did giggle a little bit when that popped up in the movie and he said he had a machine gun. And you gun in say his butt. the Japanese people are behind this. Yeah. Oh he shot out of his hands and his butt. Oh he had God. 360 firepower that way. <laughs> but of course, if it's is coming this, behind you, that's what's back there, right? I mean, <laughs> you got an opening. Why not use it? Yeah, it's know. like you're not, you're not, you know, you're not eating food and pooping it out. We might as well put a gun up there. Feed him bullets. <laughs> If I'm it, to believe many old cowboys, they feed him barbed wire, and that's where the bullets come out. Or maybe it's vice versa. <laughs> Chewing on a chain link. <laughs> Is this Bill Nye's uh, only role he's ever had where he doesn't play like a sex-crazed 55-year-old man? Well, we don't know what Dr. Elephant or whatever his name is is doing behind closed doors. I mean, he looked a little pervy to me. But he, he's not. He, he's, he doesn't have it out in the open. And it was a nice, it was yes. a nice change. It was a nice, refreshing change. What he was, I think he was, was he an art dealer or something on an episode of Doctor Who in the early two thousands, something like that. I know he was on one of those episodes, and I, I think he was just in an art gallery the entire time, so he couldn't be a, a, a <laughs> couldn't be so creepy. Yeah. Out of the three of us, you're the only one who knows the answer to that one, Adam. I, that's that's all I got. It is maybe an episode of Doctor Who somewhere. I watched I a bunch of Doctor song. Who until Matt Smith was done on his run, and then I stopped watching. Yeah, that's about smart. <clears throat> yeah, I picked it up with uh, Calipaldi. Was that his name? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's when I picked up Doctor Who. Hmm. Did I miss much? Mm, I, well, yeah, you kind of missed the be- all the best stuff, really. <laughs> and you miss you missed the really angry first season of Doctor Who. <laughs> like, what if what if like you came away and like you you only watched the last three Star Wars movies and be like, oh, you mean there's other stuff outside of these three? Hey, well, I no, might want to ch- watch the last two. That's kind of where I'm I I might want to check that out to see what happens. Oh, let's shoot, see what these the are big good. deal is with that helmet. <laughs> 
Oh, my dad, my grandpa had a helmet. Who cares? This is this show. Well, he dumb. talks about his grandpa a lot. <laughs> he must have been a really, <laughs> really cool guy. I didn't even recognize Kirsten Bell in this by any stretch of the imagination. It was just like this could have been anyone. I feel like, and and I like her as an actor. Don't get me wrong, but I, I feel like we overpaid because it could have been anybody. But that's true with a lot of people in this movie because they're not playing to their type. And so, like, looking it up, I was like, ah, oh, hey, look at that. You know, like, I didn't know David Allen Greer. I didn't know Alan Tudyk. Um, you know, when when they, like, I definitely didn't know that Elle Fanning is in this. <laughs> but if you need somebody to bark like a dog, D. Bradley Baker's your guy. Like, oh, man, you'll see him cast in every, he is the voice of Eagly, by the way. The voice yes, of yes. Eagly is uh, Trash Can in this movie. Yes, Which, yes. by the way, I, first of all, I love Trash Can as a character, uh, this little Trash Can dog, and I feel like if I've got a little squatty, tiny, roundy-looking dog, Trash Can, not a bad name. <laughs> I had a Basset Hound that uh, that would have been a fitting name. But uh, just I, I love that stupid, stupid character. I'm just like, yeah, that's if you had a little... You know, a little popco thing of that. I, I, I would. They knew what they were doing. Uh, yeah, exactly. They're like, let's make it cute. They'll love a little trash dog. <laughs> now, do either of you guys have any memory of this being released theatrically? Because I feel like I didn't know about it until Adam suggested we watch it. I think I remember like maybe seeing a trailer or a poster somewhere but nothing nothing really big i mean this is 2009 so we're in the midst of you know a lot of superhero stuff going on i don't know why this wouldn't you know I, i'm not saying that this movie was going to open number one i don't think anybody has that kind of crazy thoughts but it, it should do at least halfway decent in 2009 you would think but this th is uh this is a movie that i was certain that i had uh, got through Netflix when it was a mail order order service. Hmm. Uh, and so I, 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 I thought I remembered seeing it and I thought I remembered hating it. And then I put the, I put the movie on, uh, the other day and I was like, Oh, I, I haven't seen this at all. And I realized <laughs> that I had completely, uh, uh, mixed it up in my head. The Adventures of Tin Tin and Astro <laughs> oh, Boy. Oh, wow. That is a big difference because we've reviewed. Maybe you weren't with us when we reviewed The Adventures of Tin No, I was there. I was okay. there. I've, I, I have. And, and, and I remember liking it pretty well, The Adventures of Tin Tin. But I, I at the first watch, I hated it. I think I found the problem. I was just looking here at the box office for the weekend. I think this might have came out the same weekend as the universally loved where the wild things are. So that's why we don't remember this. Oh, so this was probably somewhere in a February kind of area. October. October. Well, they had some. Yeah, where the wild things are, man. That's a Halloween movie. They they were hoping for hope against that because that's a, they, that's this a was horrible Oscar bait. spot to put it, man. This was Oscar bait. They thought this would be best animated feature. I mean, Arcade Fire was robbed. Here's the thing, like, <laughs> you know, it certainly could have been uh, was it even was it even nominated for uh, for a best animated feature cuz that was uh, that was a category by then, yeah. I don't think it was nominated, man. I don't, That's the kind of thing that I think I would know if it was. You would I don't know, it just feels like they spent enough money on it that they should just be like, yeah, that's a good enough achievement in uh, in animation. They've given us for less, uh, there, for heaven's sake. It, it was nominated for four different awards. You want to hear it? Oh, boy. <laughs> the Annie, I don't know what that is. Uh, they were nominated That's storyboarding in a feature production. All right. Uh, well. I, I, I offered another uh, up for another Annie for writing in a feature production. There's something called an Arturios Award. Oh, the Arturios. Uh, outstanding achievement in casting, and then <laughs> you, you casted the you you cast the correct people in this. Come on up here and get your award, you good guy. You looked through videotapes and pointed out the best ones. And then Young Artist Award also nominated, uh, best performance in a voiceover role, young actor or actress, Freddie Highmore. Oh well, there you go, a little Freddie mm -hmm. action. Now, now the director himself is actually, uh, I think he's coming out on the good side of this. 
because uh, Astro Boy was like his second thing. He did flushed away previous to that. This guy loves right. some animation. But uh, he also did a couple of these Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. Yes. Which, by the way, a mega buttload of money. Yes, they do. So uh, he's got about three or four of those under his belt. So he he, he took all lessons to heart and everything and is uh, bouncing back quite well. I think you know most people would be quite happy with that guy's uh, career in Hollywood may not be, you know, Steven Spielberg, but he's getting it. He's getting, he's getting many a work and I'm sure being paid decent, quite decently. It came out two months before avatar. So maybe it was overshadowed at the box office. <laughs> by avatar. That was the problem is that they were still in the transition from 35 millimeter film over to the digitals <laughs> in order to get ready for avatar. It was sandwiched between cloudy with a chance of meatballs and avatar. So it just got forgotten. Uh, it, uh, no, I was gonna. I'm not telling that story. That's a that's a that's a private story. All right. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I was just like, I have a cloudy with a chance of meatball story. Don't tell that. Don't tell that at all. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. At least wait till Patreon. <laughs> uh, no good story from an adult starts with cloudy with a chance of meatballs. No, nah, well, it didn't end well. So there, there you have it. I suppose. Oh man. Oh man. I'm just looking, and like in 2004, I don't know if you pronounce his name, Gindy or Jindy Tartakovsky was uh, attached to a uh, Astro Boy movie that didn't get made. Oh, now that man. I bet would have been cool, man. At least it would have been turned up to 11 at that point because this and it would have looked like cell animation too. Yeah, I think ultimately, like I said, I think part of the problem with this movie, at least from a visual perspective, is that there are some scenes, especially like once they get down on Earth, because that's more of your wasteland and everything. It then that's when they throw in all the work, but like up up in the Elysium part, as I like to call it, <laughs> the Elysium, <laughs> <laughs> up in the Elysium upstairs and everything where all the rich people are and they've got all of their stuff. Uh, it's just it, everything is too smooth and nothing really. I mean, it's, it's a design choice, but it's also one that makes it look like you ran out of money and stopped doing stuff. It's the third Gnomes movie. The um, you know the I, I I'm 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 gonna re, I'm gonna restate this again. Like I was I was pleasantly surprised by this movie. I didn't think I didn't think it would be like you know like like some hidden secret gem that doesn't really exist in animation. Not really. Yeah. Like the Mitchells versus the Machines is probably the last one of those. But man, it it it, it also it's not. It's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, we could we have watched far far worse movies than this. And here's the thing: this is a this it's in a weird spot because this is a PG movie, and and like I said, I think for like your eight to twelve year olds, that's really kind of the main spot for a movie like this, where it's like you don't want it to be too kiddy, but you know they're not quite ready to see a whole bunch of PG thirteen films or anything like that. This movie doesn't treat you like you're, you know, a dumb, stupid child. There is actual honest to goodness plot going on here. And if you're not following it, you, you know, you won't get it. Uh, you know what it's like to me? I just figured it out. Okay. I, like I, I was scratching around for it and I figured it out. It's like those mid 2000s Nickelodeon movies like Jimmy Neutron. Yes. And yes, that that's a great, style. that's a great equivalent mm -hmm. because those movies aren't bad either. They're just not Pixar. And so you, like you, you know, when you're watching those movies with your kids, at least I did, because my kids were right in that wheelhouse. They love Jimmy Neutron and they love those movies, but I did not. I was like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay. All right. Wait, let's, uh, let's keep going. And so there is a little bit of that going on with this movie too. But it, it, again, it, it was not terrible. Jimmy Neutron uh, nominated for an Oscar, if memory serves. I feel like I believe I've seen a Jimmy Neutron animation sitting in a, a chair over at the Oscars years back. I'm not when looking that at Jimmy up. Neutron yeah, movie I, came out. I, I, I don't want certain. that on my on my browser history. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, police. <laughs> this guy really likes his Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, take a look. If this was put out by another, like someone else today, or or updated, could this could this story, this idea, and everything actually work, or is it something that here in the United States we just don't care about, and it's well, not going to be like stop trying to make Astro Boy a thing? I think if you just make Astro Boy like an actual anime, it's going to get its, uh, you know, it's going to get the the 
the U.S. has such a large audience that's fractionated into so many pieces. If you made it with a realistic budget, it, w- it would find its fan base. But I don't, I just don't know that much of anything from the 1950s uh, gets successfully updated unless it's been updated all, all along for Western audiences, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the way that you make this work is you, you know, you have, you, you do the Voltron method with this thing where, you know, you put it on Netflix you, you hire the right people to make, to make the show, to make, that make the right decisions that make, make something where you're not trying to keep the Japanese-ness out of it. You embrace it. And I think it would find an audience fairly quickly. Yeah. And I think getting the right animation studio with it, some people would check it out just for the studio, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's been around as recently as 2003. I think it ran for about 40, I don't know, 40 or 50 episodes in 2003. So it's not like it's. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, but that's, you know, in Japan. But uh, if you just look at it as an anime and you get good anime creators to, to translate and tell the story, I'm sure that it could be fine. I just, you know, it's still very dated. You know, and, yeah. and I don't know. I don't know what the nostalgia value is for it because it's more nostalgic in the East than it is in the West. Sure. Yeah, and like I said, when when it comes down to like you know the art style and everything, he I always like would see him in you know like Wizard or something like that, and you just see him, and it was like it was cool looking, but it was never like boy, I feel like I need to read that. <laughs> it was like yeah, all I right, it's this that. little anime guy. All right, cool. Well, moving it was on. from a time when cartoons and comics were for children, you know, so he's a, he's a kid's character. But do, but at the same time too, then with this, uh, like I said, with that kind of PG level here and everything it was, did we, did they side too much on a little bit of more of a serious tone than they should have? Or should it, did it, is it lacking a wackiness they, for you or what? I think it went for too much emotion and it wasn't executed well. And, uh, you know, you need to get, it's just kind of, I'm, I'm trained for a certain story structure in a movie. And by the midpoint of the movie, I'm expecting a big action set piece in a big action movie. Yeah. And we don't really get that till the third act, which is kind of weird. I, I really think they could have made this a, a better paced and more interesting movie by having more, you know, showing off the powers that Astro Boy has a little bit more. Yeah. There's, there's certainly because like they, they have a couple of fights and stuff, but it, if you had two or three more of those kind of big set pieces in there, I think you're right. It would have just uh, uh, turned the up pit, the fun the, factor, you know? The pit fight should have been in the middle, and it's not. It's like at the, the beginning right. of the third act, that, which is That's not. exactly what I'm thinking would have made a good halftime show. And then you have Astro Boy on the run the, the rest of the movie, and then yeah. the big fight, you know, with the President Stone bot at the end. But they really paced it out because they're trying to make it a Pixar film. And like nobody's breaking out in tears for Astro Boy. I'm sorry, Imagi or Imagi or however you put Imagi. You just don't have what it takes for that. But you could have made a nice, fun action movie. I don't you know. know. You could have made like a, a a less emotional version of Big Hero Six. You just you just need the action in there. Yeah, and that's and, what's cool about Astro Boy. Is he looks like a kid, but he's stronger than adults, and that's why kids like him. Yeah, and so he's, but he's got, kind of got like the little bit of Superman thing where he's got to kind of hide it from everybody, which is like, like I said, this thing goes through like fifteen different plot and, lines from different, and, you know, properties and stuff like and that, and jams it all in one show. The hiding it from everybody is a thing for this movie. Like Astro Boy was Astro Boy, I believe, classically. I don't think he had a secret identity. I think he was just Astro Boy that made him fun. I guess we're always just trying to, you know put a Clark Kent into something to, cause outside of that, like if Superman was just Superman all the time, would you, would you care about Superman? Yeah. Curious, you know, curious question to ask, but I think they, you know, we were saying, could it be successful? Here's what I'm thinking now, because it does have the potential for really good, like retro futuristic vibe. So you give it a story that's paced and similar to the Incredibles. Okay. And I think you could make a pretty, pretty winning story out of this. But if you start off by not having the father say, I hate him and trying to kick him out the door, you got to have him being separated from his father by circumstance. So you feel some emotional desire for that reunification to happen. 
Yeah, I don't think that that storyline would have made it past the Pixar story group. I think uh, having the father say, <laughs> yeah. I, I, "I want you gone. I don't like you anymore." He's just that, a robot. Disassemble him. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's not like cut. he de- like he does have all of my son's memories and feelings and everything, and and believes himself to just be back alive all of a sudden. But he's not the same. Or or even like Astro Boy uses his robot hearing to hear uh, his his quote father talking to Doctor Elephant. And he's saying, like, I just can't feel the emotion for him like I thought he could. And Astro Boy hangs his head and decides to run away. And as soon as he's out of earshot, he says, but I don't care. I'm going to love him anyhow. Exactly. You know, like, and he misses. And then, you know, he thinks his father hates him, but his father's out there looking for him. And you get that emotional sign to it. And then he has to save his father from the big bad at the end. You have the gladiator fight at the midpoint. Astro Boy gets to show off that he's stronger than all the, the people bigger than him. That's the appeal to this character. And uh, I, I'm not saying you're winning awards, but I'm saying you make your money back at the box office and you get a couple of sequels that go straight to Redbox. And your production company doesn't go down a turlet. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then again, I've never, I've never led a production company, so something tells me they probably would go down the turlet if they gave me the keys to the kingdom. Because <laughs> nobody wants that many Blob and Rhino movies. Give me the keys to the toilet kingdom, will you please? Thank you. <laughs> A lot of them on a long chain. All right, before we get to our final grade here and everything, we have to ask ourselves one very important question is, how does this animated film relate back one-to-one with Sylvester Stallone? Why, thank you, Adam. I have a prepared statement. No. Hey, Mr. Stallone. D. Bradley Baker is the voice of the trash can and Astro Boy, which we spoke about earlier, which really shouldn't come as much of a surprise since he has 639 credits to his resume. And if there's a cartoon being made, he probably has a voice in it. But when you're working on so many things, yes, you're on the big high profile stuff, the stuff that's good, like the original Space Jam and the Star Wars cartoons and Harvey Birdman, attorney at law. But you're also in the bad stuff like Bruno the Kid and Bruno the Kid or Bruno the Kid. I had totally forgotten that Bruce Willis had a cartoon series in the 90s based on himself as an 11-year-old spy. There were 36 (laughs) episodes. I've never actually seen the show because I have taste, but there's a few things to recommend this show. Like, the show gave Judy Tenuta and Bronson Pinchot a job. There is also never a toy line. And probably most importantly, it was the favorite show of some very dumb children. Children like Wolfie the Black, who happens to be an IMDb user, and he wrote the the review entitled, I Loves This Show. Loves this show. (laughs) Quote, I remember every weekday at 2.30 p.m. on UPN. During the summer, this show came on, and I couldn't miss it. Sadly, it went off once school started, and it never came on again. It was one of my favorite cartoons. And I don't care if it was a vanity cartoon. Isn't every cartoon a vanity cartoon? (laughs) This one was actually good. It was entertaining, exhilarating, and I loved all the gadgets he got with each mission. Not to mention all the ways Charlie told Bruno to call Globe at the beginning. Oh, and if you're so upset about the fact that Bruno was bald, I mean, if that thought haunts you so much that you use that you lose sleep, think of it this way. Wasn't Charlie Brown also bald? End quote. <laughs> Wolfie the Black. Wolfie the Black is who wrote that, Mr. Stallone. I can't speak for the other guys on this show here, but Wolfie the Black has certainly changed my mind. Every cartoon is a vanity project. D. Bradley Baker was also the voice of Sebastian in Suicide Squad, which also boasts the voice talents of you, Mr. Sylvester Stallone. And that's your Stallone connection this week. D. Bradley Baker. I'll attempt to do better next week. Sweet Shaunzi from the internet. My, my, my. Well, here at Here Movie Podcast, we have our own patented Robin rating system. If you'd like to check that out, head on over to our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash hero movie podcast. Bruce, where does... Astro Boy from 2009 following the Robin Drake system for you. It just bored me, man. I, and I'm, I hate it. It bored me. And I was turned off by the animation style. Like, I don't want to be an animation snob per se, but there's like a certain part where CGI 3D stuff just wasn't quite there yet unless it was Pixar. And uh, I'm going to give this like the Stephanie Brown. Like, I, I can barely remember what happened in this movie already. Yeah. Sean? For me, it's a low Damien Wayne. Um, 
it surprised me with the the level of competence of this movie. Although there are some some shocking things in it, like oh my 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 this being I built, I don't care for it anymore. Goodbye. Like that, that's very strange to me. And the fact that it was like it was about ten seconds to where your son's dead. You've got a piece of hair. Okay, now I'm kind of cool with it because I got a project, and then you kick it to the curb. What? It's it's pretty crazy. Um, so for those reasons, I'm giving it a a low. Damien Wayne, um, but uh, uh, I, I I I can't recommend it. Like, don't bother. Don't waste your time watching it. If you asked me at, when we started this show, I probably would have said hi, Damien Wayne. However. Bruce does make a very compelling point and pitched a pretty good movie that had some plot points in there and other things where I was just like, ah, shucks. I guess I kind of like, I don't want, and since you put it Stephanie Brown, I don't want to go Stephanie Brown. So I'm going to go low Damian Wayne on this. You did talk me down pretty much a letter grade as it were, uh, because yeah, I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. And I, I don't know, maybe I was just happy to get out of work early. They stopped our second set. So I came home at like midnight and watched this crap and I don't know, maybe maybe because my bar was set so low that I was like, eh, I had a fun enough time with it. But so, you know, low Damien that's Wayne. What for- it has, that's what I had going for it, for sure, is that I totally did not expect it to be this. Yeah, and so I, 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 can't, I can't put it at Stephanie Brown, so just low Damien Wayne on this, but you can do a lot worse. But like I said, like I said, it's also it's that good point for, you know, like eight to 12, like eight to 12 year old boys, probably about the best thing that you could, you know, it's like, oh, there's a lot of fun and, to be had in that. And uh, I'm just going to say this, guys, I think that there is like a live action show from the 60s based oh, on Astro Boy. boy. So like, if I can find a couple episodes on YouTube or something, can we consider that Absolutely. As a possibility of something to watch and comment on? Because I, I, I want to see how they do a live action Astro Boy in the 60s. <laughs> Yes, please. A lot of cardboard and tape, I'm a guess. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> maybe a sparkler here or there or something like that. You never know. Or maybe they went really big and started just blowing people's arms off. Who's to say? <laughs> uh, so next week, we're going to be uh, doing our 400th episode of Hero Movie Podcast. My word, it has been uh, quite the journey. And at the same time, too, like we said, it's also Patreon month. Uh, so at the end of the month, every uh, time we just say, hey, what do you guys want to watch? And we decided to go back into our catalog here. Uh, so some of the earliest HMP movies we want to see, if you guys want to hear those uh, in a different way. See what we've learned in the past almost eight years with this bad boy. Uh, So we got X-Men Days of Future Past, Superman the Movie, which was the birth of the Stallone connection, by the way, Uh, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, uh, Blade, and Guardians of the Galaxy. So we're going to put all of those, uh, like, you know, kind of perennial all-stars, a lot of those. That's not too shabby. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll see what you guys think. We'll re-review those, see if our reviews line up with what we'd previously said and stuff, and uh, kind of celebrate the 400 episodes, even though we probably will mention it maybe once. But, you know, it's fun. Uh, so that's patreon.com slash HMP. In the meantime, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the Internet? I just want people to uh, check out the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Bruce Leslie. And you can check out my son's channel, White Raven, where he did a great review of this really cool Modoc figure. So, yeah, look for that stuff on YouTube. Sean? We have a podcast called The Book of Robert Fettuccini, uh, 30 Questions, where each week we watch The Book of Boba Fett and we say, hey, here's some good questions I got for that, for that Gianni. And uh, we ask them, and it's a good time. You should listen. Yeah, and there's all kinds of different shows and stuff starting up and starting down. And so as soon as we're finishing up one thing, we're starting other stuff. So uh, keep an eye out for all of that kind of good stuff. Links are in the show notes. Uh, And the film find is back. I'm talking Scream 5 and a couple of other things this week. So a couple of episodes. Instead of like big full episodes, I'm going to drop a couple of smaller episodes for you. Uh, so check out the film fine wherever you find finer podcasts. That is it, everybody. Join us next week for our Patreon select for Sweet Sounds of Kovacs from the Internet. Bruce Leslie, I'm Adam Porters. Stay super, everybody. Hi, Marty and Evie. You're wondering who I am. Secret, secret, I got a secret. Machine or mannequin. Secret, secret, I got a secret. With parts made.
Machines dehumanize. 